This is the day the Lord has made. Rejoice and be glad in it. So good to hear you say that every Sunday and something that we need to say all the time. To our video audience, welcome. It's good to have you with us. And uh, to all of you who are here, welcome. It's good to see you. Uh, for our video audience, my name is Sherwin. I'm the pastor here and I've been here a while. So I'm a little forgetful today, you know. Got up in the first service before Shelly was done. And I always say, well, it's good to get your mistakes over with early in the day, you know. And so we did that, but I'm on, am I okay now, time-wise? Doing good, sure. Oh, okay, good, good. A um, few announcements. Oh, I wanted to show you why I was a little spacey if I got the first slide up. That's what I did yesterday. It's your granddaughter's fifth birthday. And uh, we left at 5.30 in the morning, got back 10 o'clock last night from Chicago. And so I'm seeing traffic all the time. But it, it, was, it was kind of fun. And uh, when you're a pastor and you control the you know, slides, you get to show off a little bit. So this is me showing off. And uh, we had fun out there. Um, let's see, announcement-wise. The Vacation Bible School thing is going to happen on Tuesday night, so bring your kids in. And uh, Janine has this thing for, what's it called? Kids Belong. Do you have anything you want to say about that? Sure, I'll do it for you. All right. Um, kids Belong is a local nonprofit um, here in our county that supports uh, foster families, adoptive families, kinship and guardianship families. Um, Ernie and I started fostering in 2001, and um, we asked the church last year, and we're asking the churches again this year, if you would help us. We are doing three this year back-to-school events, and we are asking for donations of new backpacks. They can be for boys, girls, young, old. We help preschoolers through college, and we have three events um, and help the families. The kids come with their families, fill their, pick out a new backpack, and then we need school supplies as well. Um, school supplies of any kind, there's a list on the tub back there. Um, you can scan the code as well. Um, the kids come, fill a backpack with their school supplies. Um, and there is such a high need. We served over 400 children last year. The need's going up. There are so many more kids coming into care every day. Um, it is on my page every day. There's three kids into care, four kids, sibling groups. Um, so there's just a huge need, kinship and guardianship families, lots of grandparents supporting children. There's no financial help there, so I'm just asking if our church will help come on board with this. Um, we have about four weeks before our first event. So um, if you can't um, shop personally, I will be glad to shop for you, or you can scan the code and, and donate. But um, again, we served over 400 children last year, and I know the need is greater this year, so thank you. And there's a... A tub uh, back there a for... A tub on the table, the, yeah. Yeah, uh, for supply, whatever supplies, are, you know, school, back to school supplies and, and new backpacks as well. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Janine. Thanks for doing that. You know, it is a huge need. So, all right, Heather, you want to come and talk to us? Sure. <laughs> Heather doesn't like to get up in front, so this is kind of fun for me to watch this, you know? Um, so, you guys know I'm Heather Wilkie, just from being here and such. However, I don't know all of you. So, we're going to restart the name tags. If you're interested, come on back at the end of the service. You don't have to take them home. They get hung right by the coats. So, we'd love to learn who you all are. That's good. It's, thanks for doing that, too. Okay, and I believe, oh, membership class. It's always... Uh, uh, kind of a scary exercise to schedule a membership class in the summertime, but I like to offer them every couple of months for if folks want to do it. So if you sign up today, there's sign-up sheets in the back. We'll have one next Sunday. So just wanted to make that known to everybody. There, is, there are sign-up sheets in the back for that. And I believe that is all of the announcements that we have. So let's... Uh, Let's enter into a time of prayer. It's something we all need, and I'd like you to, in your mind's eye, picture Jesus sitting in front of you, looking at you as we do this. So let's pray together, shall we? Lord, today we come before you knowing that you've called us into so many different roles in our lives. You've called us to be children. You've called us to be parents. You've called us to be grandparents. and 
We're thankful for all those opportunities. We're thankful for the opportunity of life itself and the good gifts that you would give to each one of us. So we pray for, for ourselves and for the gifts that you've given us that we'll be wise stewards of them. We pray for Lake and Bethel that your vision for this church becomes everyone's vision that we become a place that's known for how we help foster parents, how we help those who need the help without being judgmental, how we have, are making a positive difference in the community. Help us to be the kind of church that everyone would miss if we weren't here. Help us to be your hands and feet, your voice in this community. And we think today, too, of those who've lost loved ones. We've had, a, as you know, a brisk week here with a funeral and a few other things going on. We ask for your blessings for those who've lost loved ones, whether it was this week or this year or 10 years ago. We pray that your peace will be with especially those who are grieving. And then we can all think of two or three folks who need your blessing. So in this moment of silence, we present them to you and ask you to send a special blessing their way. And now, Lord, we come before you, know, and you know that we don't always listen to everything you have for us. But this morning, we, we want to open ourselves up to you. And my prayer is for everyone in this room that their faith is renewed and strengthened and that we move forward with open minds, anticipating the blessings that you have for us. So bless us in that. Amen. So I've been filing for years now all these sermons, crosstalks, uh, by the scripture passage. That way when I come to a passage that I think we should do again, I can look up what I've done before with it and uh, how long it's been. It's been nine years since I've used this passage. And this passage has been a key influencer behind our core value A, the first core value there. It's on the cover of every bulletin that we put out, and it reads like this. Everyone, regardless of who they are, what they've done, or what they're doing, will be accepted here. Lake and Bethel will be a safe place to explore your relationship with Jesus. And I remember putting that thing together, coming to a board meeting, to a consistory meeting, and thinking, this is never going to pass. This is a lead balloon type issue. You know, it's just not going to go through it all. And to my great surprise, the consistory of Lake and Bethel liked it. And they said, oh, we need to make this a part of who we are. And ever since then, it has been. But, you know, uh, other churches don't like it. It's kind of fun how, uh, kind of funny how that works. See, and in the, in the Reformed church, you know, we have Dutch roots and we split off from the Roman Catholic Church in the late mid to late 1500s and what happened was we decided that we weren't going to be like the Catholics we don't want bishops we don't want a, a heavy government like that so we didn't instead all the pastors in a certain district which we call a classes the Presbyterians call it a presbytery, and essentially it's the same thing as uh, Presbyterian style government. In this district then, all the pastors hold each other accountable. So like I would be accountable to every other pastor in the classes and they would be accountable to me, kind of like a corporate bishop instead of a single bishop. And that's, that's just how it worked. And so I proposed this to the Muskegon classes shortly after we approved it here and well nope that didn't go over and I thought you know this would be a good thing our core values for the Reformed Church in America where we could substitute the word Lake and Bethel for the Reformed Church in America will be a safe place to uh, explore your relationship with Jesus 
Never made it out of committee. Didn't want that. And uh, that troubled me, of course. But you know, our recent split, the last two years we lost 47% of our membership and uh, there's still churches that are trying to decide if they're going to go bankrupt or not uh, after the COVID thing came at roughly the same time. But half our church is left over this issue. It's the issue of who we can let in and who we can't let in. So they, they left and started the Alliance of Reformed Churches and a few other little ones. But I'm troubled by the fact that half of this denomination thought that way. Now, when I started out, I was going to be a neocon. When I started out, when I was in, a student at Western Seminary in Holland, just down the road, I wanted to be a champion of orthodoxy, and I wanted to bring back the real Reformed Church. Got into it. Um, just to illustrate this, how many of you in here have heard of the Heidelberg Catechism? Ah, a few of you. Anybody raised Christian Reformed in here? A few of you, all right. So you know all about this, this little document here with 129 questions and answers called the Heidelberg Catechism. It is the symbol of orthodoxy for Reformed people and is written in Heidelberg, Germany, hence the name Heidelberg Catechism. Well, in my zeal to be a conservative, I memorized that entire catechism because the professor, his name was Gene Osterhaven, he said, if you memorize this, you don't have to write a paper. You just have to be able to answer all the questions. So 129 questions, I figured out that if I memorized five questions a week, I'd, I'd be in pretty good shape. And I memorized that thing. And the final was you, you went up and he gave you a list of six or seven questions to answer. And if you could answer them, you were, you'd got an A for the course. And of course, I wanted that A. I went nuts over this thing. I memorized the punctuation of the answers. I was that much into it. And today I agree with probably three-fourths of it. But I was going to be a shining example of a return to orthodoxy, a bright intellectual conservative in the Reformed Church. And then I got a divorce. And this peer system, they didn't want to keep me in the Reformed Church. But you know what it was? The liberals didn't come after me. It was the conservatives that did. And I, I felt really betrayed, among other things. So years pass. Well, first of all, the classes. In that process, I called my old teacher and friend who was a pastor in Spring Lake, Michigan. His name was Dick Ram. I called him up during that process. I said, Dick, this is what the Dakota classes is doing. Can you help me out? And he goes, of course. Who are the old guys in the classes? And I told him who they were. All of them are younger than what I am now. But they were the old guys then. And he said, oh, I'll make a few phone calls. And he did. And the next meeting, I was reinstated by one vote. But he was able to persuade us. So, a few years pass, I end up in the Muskegon classes. And, uh, you know, one of the first things I did is I had coffee with Dick Rim. And about a year or two goes by, and all of my peers in the, in the Muskegon classes wanted to get rid of Dick Rim. And it was a jealousy thing. He had a, the largest church in this class, it was 2,000 people on Sunday morning. And he was doing well. But there was jealousy and whatnot. They, got, they succeeded. They got rid of him. And uh, the church went independent and died. Which happens frequently. Uh, do you know that denominational churches have three times the lifespan of independent churches? It's just a uh, statistical fact. So that happened. But with Dick, it was not the liberals that came after him. It was the conservatives that came after him, too. And I couldn't fight him. 
Well, a few years after that, we were doing a joint Thanksgiving service or something with other churches in this neighborhood. And uh, this, that particular year was going to be held at Prince of Peace. And I went there for some preparation stuff. And they had this gal running the music at Prince of Peace named Amy McDonald. I was really impressed by her. We had a music director here who was a little on the bossy side, and she backed him right into a corner. I said, this gal's all right. And so I went up to her, and I said, you know, uh, Amy, if you ever decide you want to jump the fence, come and see me, because we've got an opening, you know, pretty quick coming up here. And uh, it was interesting, the next, I think it was the next day, she brought her resume to Diane, and that's how it worked. We hired her. Um, Ken Hooker was influential with that decision, and Lloyd Bannock and a few other of the old timers who were on a sort of search committee with, with me on that. We interviewed her and we hired her. And she did well. She was making some things happen. All of a sudden I get a call from the leadership of the Muskegon classes. We need to meet. And so we met here in our parlor. I had uh, three or four of our elders sat in on this, but they were mad at me because I was letting a Catholic lead worship services here. I said, what do you mean? She's taking the class. She's going to be as reformed as you within a couple of weeks. Oh, I can't, we can't do that. What does it say to the community? And I thought, oh. again, it wasn't the liberal pastors that came after me on that. It was the conservative ones. Now, I'm telling you this just because I have a confession to make. Now, it's difficult for me to practice this because when I see those guys who came after me, you know, all those years ago or different things like that, I think, oh, man, I really have trouble trusting people who think a certain way and accepting people who think a certain way. So I have to yell at myself every time I look at that. And I find that I'm not alone. We all have certain folks that we don't want to hang out with. You know, it's interesting. You go to a, a restaurant and you see a group of folks standing outside the restaurant smoking cigarettes. And if you listen, you watch people walk by, they, they kind of walk by like, Phew. you know, and some even will say something, oh, that smells so disgusting, et cetera, like that. We're prejudiced. We don't accept cigarette smokers. And, of course, rednecks and educated people are always at each other's throats. Rednecks don't trust educated people, and educated people don't trust rednecks. That's just a fact. Now, I speak redneck fluently. That is my native language, my first language. But other rednecks don't always look kindly on me because they find out, oh, he's a redneck with a doctorate. He must be crazy. And yeah, I am. So, you know, it's okay. But educated folks tend to be look down their nose at rednecks. And we all look down our noses at old people, right? Oh, they drive too slow. They stand in line at Wesco and fumble with, who pays cash anymore? It's all these old people, you know, and, and uh, we just and look at them. Them. Huh? Said, now we are them. Yeah, now we are them, that's correct. And, and the thing is too, I've always had a prejudice against pastors. It's the strangest thing, but I, I avoid other pastors like the plague, you know, it's like, I'm gonna get COVID if I'm around them or something. And we avoid people with divergent political views. You know that. Before you get out of this building today, you'll probably hear somebody having a political discussion. It's that way. Wealthy people look down their noses at poor people because they think, well, they were too lazy to get an education or they, you know, whatever. They... And poor people look down their noses at wealthy people because they're convinced you don't get rich unless you're ripping somebody off. And so there's that. And then there's racism. Frustratingly, it is alive and well in this country and in this community. It's a fact. 
then we're all prejudiced against people with bad personal hygiene. Nobody wants to be around somebody who stinks. But just think about the folks that you avoid. Who do you avoid? You know, think about that. Well, Jesus has something to say about this, something quite strong. We're using, like I said, the passage from Luke chapter 5 today. We're going to go through it and see what it has to say to us. Later, as Jesus left the town, this was Jerusalem, he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Levi got, got up, left everything, and followed him. Now what Levi is doing is he's kind of like being an IRS agent. You know, nobody likes to see an IRS agent come to your door either. But he was collecting money for the Roman government. The Roman government had just come into the nation of Israel and said, we're in charge now. So the people that went to work for the, the Roman government were considered traitors. Just like when Germany took over the Netherlands and France, people that were nice to the German soldiers were considered traitors. That's what this was kind of like. And uh, these tax collectors were very wealthy people, some of the most wealthy people in every community. Because what Rome said was, you can charge what you want for taxes, this is how much we want. So like the Roman government would come along and say, well, we want 500 million from Laketon Township, we don't care how you get it. And anything in surplus that you get, you get to keep for your services. So they'd just go up to people and say, you owe 300,000, you owe this, whatever. And if you didn't pay it, a Roman battalion would show up at your door real soon. So it's kind of a scary thing. They paid the Roman government a certain amount and got to keep the rest for themselves. And guess what happened to these tax collectors? Nobody liked them. They were barred from everything. They were even barred from the synagogues, which is the equivalent to a church. They could not go to those gatherings. The people didn't want them there. Jesus recruited one of those guys to be one of his students. And here's how the narrative goes on. Later, Levi held a banquet in his home with Jesus as the guest of honor. Now, most likely this was a, a mansion. Many of Levi's fellow tax collectors and other guests also ate with them. But the Pharisees and their teachers of religious law complained bitterly to Jesus' disciples. Why do you eat and drink with such scum? Now, there were maybe even some non-Jews there, which would make the Jewish people unclean and they couldn't go to their synagogues and they couldn't uh, go to the temple or anything like that. Maybe they were associating with people who weren't even Jewish. And they were wealthy. No doubt Levi's peers were all quite wealthy and all considered very unscrupulous. And Jesus was a guest of honor in the home of someone that most people thought was a criminal. And of course it got folks to talk it. What will people say about this? But Jesus never cared about popular opinion, which is one of the very attractive things about him. So here's the next step. Jesus answered them, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I've come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent. Now, I like the New Living Translation, which is what I'm using here, because I think it's correctly nuanced. I think they get the drift of what the original Greek was saying, it's telling us that we need to admit that we're sinners, that we need to repent and make changes. Because if you don't think you need to make changes, you can't grow. These people thought they were spiritually healthy. And if you think you're spiritually healthy, you can't be helped. You can't help someone who won't participate in the process. Now, I used to live in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And while I was there, I had a couple of dirt bikes. The last one was a modified Honda 350 CB, for those of you who are into that sort of thing. And the, uh, Tulsa is in a river valley. So it's always hot and humid. It's 
well, it's quite a way south of here, you know, it's Oklahoma is just North Texas. And uh, it would always be hot and humid. So I'd get on these dirt bikes at night, didn't wear a helmet, because you didn't have to in Oklahoma, didn't even wear a shirt most of the time, because, you know, I was a young stud at the time. And I would ride down to the riverbank through these six foot tall weeds and whatnot. And I would come back sometimes with spots like this all over me. And I asked around what those were, and I got all kinds of different explanations. I went to church with this guy who was an a intern allergist, and I had him look it over, free medical care. You know, and uh, he said, those, that's not an allergic reaction to anything. Those are chigger bites. And I thought, what? He explained to me, he says, chiggers are the larva of some sort of bug, and they land on your skin and chew it up and itch like crazy, and then after two days, they, they mature and they fly away. And sure enough, after a couple of days, those things started to get better. They like to tackle your feet if you've got socks on. They like to go anywhere where there's tight clothing. They especially like being around your belt and digging there and so that it itches for a couple of days like crazy. It's nasty stuff. Well, <coughs> here's a hilarious thing. During COVID, I started getting that look right around my belly, which is a pretty good sized canvas for chigger bites, you know? And I was getting so cranky about it. I thought, well, in a couple of days, they're going to heal up. But I didn't know there were chiggers in, in Michigan. I thought, well, they're going to heal up in a couple of days. They didn't. got worse. And firmly believing that Michigan didn't have chiggers, I got suspicious because I hadn't been on any trails or in any tall grass. And I'm married to a nurse. We say, you've got hives. No, I don't have hives. But you can see why, that's what hives looks like on the foot. You can see what, they look similar. So I read up on it. Said that hives are primarily caused by stress. I said, stress? I've taken more psychological testing because of this job I have than anybody I know. I know that I'm, you know, insane, but I'm fit to be a pastor. So... You know, I'm pretty much aware of my flaws. I said, I there's no stress. But see, it happened when we were closed for COVID. And I was doubtful that Lake and Bethel was going to survive. I was doubtful that most churches were going to survive. And I was really down in the dumps. I was so low that you would have had to raise me up to bury me. It was that bad. But I said, I am, you know, and then Diane and a few other people said, just go to urgent care. I, said, I am not going to go see a doctor because I got little red bumps on my belly. Are you kidding me? But they itch so bad, they're just driving me crazy. You know, I was ready to start chewing on windowsills. It was just driving me nuts. And so I finally went to urgent care. And this little nurse practitioner, half my age, took a look at me and says, you've got hives. And I said, that's impossible. I don't have any stress. And she goes, I hear that a lot from guys your age. So she gave me some pills and some goop to spread on it. And sure enough, it went away. But I had to admit I needed help. And I had to go in and get it. See, that was the key. And that's why I'm telling you this story. Because you and I have a spiritual disease. We have hives on our souls. It's called sin. We need to repent. We need to admit that we're sinners and in need of salvation. And then trust Jesus to save us. And don't worry about the other guy's sin. Two things I want you to take away from this passage. One is that we need to admit our sinfulness and repent. 
It's like admitting you have hives and getting treatment. And the second thing is we need to accept folks as they are like Jesus did. The tax collectors and other scum we need to accept. If you're a conservative, you need to accept liberals. And if you're a liberal, you need to accept conservatives. You won't die from it. It's really quite easy. It happens. Now, here's what my experience is, is that if I make a conscious effort, accepting people is easy. Because no matter how weird they are, they still have something to contribute to your life. And, you know, we're all basically the same. So accepting people is relatively easy once you decide to do it. You can do this. And you'll be happier when you do. But I tell you what's hard is admitting that you're a sinner. Admitting your sin and then repenting of it much more difficult, much more challenging, but very well worth it. Uh, here's what I have to say about this, is that the doctor is in, and he's waiting for you to do it. When you do, you'll find healing for your soul. You'll find a deep peace, and you'll learn that in the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, only sinners are accepted. So admit it and let him change you. Let's pray together. Lord, we are so thankful that you are constantly working on us, that you accept us, whether we're right or left or rich or poor or male or female or gay or straight, you accept us. We can't understand it, but you do. And you invite us to clean our lives up you invite us to move forward in your grace and you commission us to accept all of your people. So show us that we'll never lock eyes on anyone you don't love and help us to be your light shining in the darkness. Amen. Um, yeah, I just want to reiterate that membership invitation. Uh, if you want, to sign up for it in the hallway, and we're going to receive our offering now. And as always, thanks for the black ink, and if you don't mind, put your names in the pads and let us know that you're here.
Good work, guys. For those of you who don't know, that's, those are father-daughter right there. And uh, it's very powerful to see them sing together. All right, let's receive the Lord's benediction. And now in whatever you do or say, let it be as a representative of the Lord Jesus, all the while giving thanks through him to God the Father. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you today and always. Amen. As always, thanks again for joining us. We have two services on Sunday morning. And if you're in town, we'd invite you to come once at 9 o'clock and once at 11 o'clock. And if you wish to support Lake and Bethel, you can go to lakesandbethel.org and follow the steps there on our website. Or you can just look at this QR code, scan it in with your phone, and you can give through Secure Give, and all your gifts will go directly into our account. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.